welcome everybody. Um, thank you for coming over to uh, to BNP Paribas. Uh, I think we are always happy to uh, to give stage to LPEA, and uh, we are as a member. Um, and also as an active uh, participant in the market, uh, we have a story to tell. So I'm, yeah, I think you need to do now with two or three minutes of me doing the introduction, and then I quickly go to uh, to the persons who are the real experts. So I'm not the real expert. Actually, somebody was telling me just when I arrived, um, you are, and, and I, I don't want to give names, you are the security man, you know, standing by the door. And it's uh, it's always a story about security and securities. So securities services. So for those who don't know, it's actually the uh, the industry. It's a big industry here in uh, Luxembourg, right? So the custodians, the administrators. That's what we do. So from an uh, very quickly from an market share perspective, we are let's say in the top three on uh, on the usage side, but also on the private capital side, we are doing it pretty well. And that's a bit the link yeah, with uh, with your business. So on the user side, we keep uh, on one part because I think it's not for you uh, that interesting. But on the private capital side, I think we have an interesting story to tell. And when I arrived, it was in 2019, we were with about, I think about 50, 50 people. We are now with 200 uh, uh, FTEs only dedicated to, uh, to the private capital sector and especially uh, focused on the uh, private debt where we do the full range including uh, financing and all let's say the important players uh, on that let's say that debt uh, that debt segment uh, are clients of ours so more or less with a hundred billions of, uh, of assets we are we're trying to uh, well actually we're leading the market from a depository perspective not from an administration perspective as you might I think most of you might know uh, grown figures the last years the last five years have been uh, pretty uh, pretty amazing so 15 percent uh, every year um, and we let's say on the LBO well, this that's the story of today uh, we of course we have uh, fund investment managers that are dedicated to these strategies uh, to LBO strategies uh, and we have these strategies here in Luxembourg uh, also in Jersey uh, and in Paris I think more or less what uh, every size I think it's also something that you uh, that uh, that you can imagine has increased significantly uh, the last uh, the last years um, and then I think if we if you look a little bit ahead, uh, I would say so where this is going to. Very difficult to uh, to to tell, and I don't know if today we are going to listen uh, to that uh, to the to the to, to the people in the panel. But I uh, for me it's always you know it's an uh, it's a question mark because the market is at the moment there's such a lot of volatility that you know the 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 war in the Ukraine, the inflation, the supply chain, it's all together. It's a whole mix, a whole cocktail of uh, unclarities. Uh, and I think also you now, if you look at the inflation, you now we here in security services, we have a quite a big uh, operational uh, group, uh, a lot of staff. I wish you a lot of people. That's you know, but uh, that I don't wish you because, I, but we have to deal with that. It's still a kind of labor-intensive uh, activity at uh, at security services. So we have here around 1,100 FTEs. So imagine the inflation, how much that is costing the 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 entity. And I think this is also. Uh, from your perspective, I think the uh, the SMEs that are dealing with that is something that uh, is 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 ch at least challenging, I would say. But of course, I'm uh, I'm very happy to uh, to uh, to listen uh, this this afternoon to the let's say the challenges and also how you see these these uh, these uh, these let's say these uh, variables. I stop here. This is uh, so again. Welcome. Uh, very happy. I'm give the mic to Stefan, who is uh, much better in uh, in all the uh, the topics than I am. So the security man gives the mic now to the expert. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Robert. Thanks to uh, BGL BNP Paribas for hosting us, also to BNP Security Services. That's always great to be back here. We did a great event last year, and uh, we also intend to do more in the future. Uh, Robert, congratulations for the good numbers. It's good that you highlighted also the challenges, and I'm sure that you know your LBOs 
quite uh, right too. So uh, today's event will be split in two parts. First of all, we will have uh, Anna Gassner from Luther and also, uh, let's say, Charles-Henri uh, Boucher from Oraxis, who will then give us a presentation on LBOs first. And then afterwards, we will invite the other panelists in order then to, uh, let's say, have uh, an interesting discussion and hope also that you will ask uh, different questions than uh, during, uh, let's say, the panel or rather afterwards. And we will continue afterwards with a networking cocktail. And now, uh, Anna and also Charles-Henri, could you please quickly introduce yourselves, uh, tell us about your role and exposure to LBOs before then you start with your presentation. If, if you might please help me to... Uh, it, it's just on, you just on. need to... Yeah. Okay, yeah. seems to work. So, thank you, Stefan. Uh, so, I'll start. My name is Anna Gastner. I'm partner uh, in the corporate M&A department of a law firm, which is called Luther. Um, <clears throat> I work uh, regularly on LBO matters here in Luxembourg and before joining Luther I used to work in Paris also in a niche boutique and exclusively in, in this uh, field of activity. Uh, yeah. So, Charles-Henri, please. Uh, Charles-Henri Bouter, I'm an investment director at Oraxis, which is a, a multifamily office here in Luxembourg. We're investing in uh, neighboring countries, Belgium, France, uh, Germany, Netherlands. We invest in uh, sustainable businesses, uh, which has a, a positive impact on the uh, environment, on the use of resources in general, and uh, on public health. Um, and we are currently um, working on um, increasing our deal flow and I think it's important to speak about more uh, about LBOs so as to generate more uh, uh, business transfers because I, I think it's a, a very uh, uh, um, current topic that is uh, uh, important for uh, for CEOs to, to deal with and uh, we have some uh, good testimonies probably to, to bring to, to the table. Thank you. Disappeared. So how can we? So we prepared a, a very short uh, presentation, just like theoretical presentation, and what is an LBO and and how it shall work. Um, so as you all probably know, LBO is a um, is an acronym and stands for leverage by out, and it's like a generic term. Um, which uh, which uh, intends to describe financial financial arrangements, whose uh, particular aim is to transfer businesses. Um, it's a leveraged financial operation, um, and w w which uh, and in order to have the acquisition of a company through the use of financial debt. So what is the interest, uh, the main interest of, uh, of such a structuration is, first of all, it's to limit the equity contribution by financing the acquisition partly with debt, uh, allow, allow shareholders, current shareholders, to increase their own ownership of, uh, cap of, of their share capital, but also allow managers to step into capital, uh, help, help by the debt and uh, of course maximize profitability of the invested capital uh, thanks to financial uh, leverage. So today it's one of the preferred uh, mechanisms used in private equity and it represents more than half of the transaction carried out each year uh, in the private equity sector. So I think we can switch on the next, thanks. Um, there are also other reasons why you should or why a SME should conduct uh, an exit or a, a business transfer through a LBO. Um, because leverage buyout, it's not just a financial operation, but it's really an alternative model of corporate ownership. Uh, it's a good opportunity to reorganize a group and its business and to adapt a shareholding structure to improve the management and, and uh, uh, efficiency of the group and its business. Um, when, when it's contemplated to, to make um, a LBO, you will need to, to, to ask yourself questions about the governance of the group and about the people you would like to have uh, joining the board and the management of, of this new group which is built after a LBO transaction. So, um, yeah. These new board members uh, will uh, bring complementary and relevant um, value 
for the company's business and future. And, and so, um, so you will also need to consider and to ask yourself which kind of PE fund I would like to, to, to partner with. Uh, and to take with me in the adventure to expand the business and, and the further uh, outcome uh, of, of the business. And I think Charles-Henri uh, will say uh, a bit more about that. <coughs> when we consider doing an LBO, we ha always have this kind of uh, financial prism. Okay? It's not just a financial operation, as you told earlier. I think it's important to... Um, to have some time to really think about the strategy of the company, to think about what are the co competences I need, uh, in uh, what kind of governance do I want to set up. And, and speaking of a private equity fund, uh, you have several types of uh, private equity funds. Uh, many PE are more financial, but more and more they are uh, tending to uh, partner with operating partners. Uh, and the alliance of operating partners and financial guys really make the trick sometimes because it's uh, important not just to, to give money and, and, uh, and uh, muscle up the, uh, or the financial part of the company. And it's so important to, uh, uh, in order to, to increase the productivity uh, to, uh, to have these uh, operating, uh, operating partners. So what exactly can an active PE fund can bring to, uh, to, uh, to the shareholders and the company? <coughs> First, we, we are dealing with a strategy. It's probably a good moment to uh, refine or rethink the, the strategy of the company. And, and the PE funds uh, do have teams to uh, work on uh, specific subjects, workshops, uh, for instance, in, uh, if you want to, to sell in a specific country uh, abroad, uh, you uh, have to deal with the customer strategy, uh, what type of, uh, of channels uh, to, uh, to sell the, the products, for instance. And um, speaking of governance, um, so there is, we need to have the right balance uh, uh, in the composition of the board of directors and so as to be proportionate, of course, to the uh, voting rights, right? But uh, also uh, bring to the uh, uh, partner with the uh, most relevant uh, uh, person that can bring, uh, that can make uh, really uh, the company um, increase its, um, its value creation. Um, about accelerating the, the business development, I mean, we are, uh, considering either organic growth or external growth and um, for instance we uh, recently we we have been uh, discussing with uh, the managers of a, of a company industrial company in Belgium and first we uh, we intended to buy out uh, a competitor and we did approach many com uh, competitors around Belgium and and uh, finally we decided that it's not the best uh, choice, the, not the best decision. But we did that uh, after a few months of, uh, of, of, um, of work uh, and workshop especially. And, and we finally decided to uh, double the uh, production capacity. Um, uh, and also, of course, we uh, are a financial, uh, there are a lot of financial profiles in PE funds that can work on uh, optimizing the deal structuring and how to finance growth, uh, find the best uh, uh, partners and uh, the, the structure of the different debts in order to finance the growth. And, and concerning the, the organization, uh, PE funds do have many conne connections also, so uh, in uh, HR, uh, uh, HR uh, and especially to find the right talents to, uh, to improve the uh, uh, different uh, services of, of the company. All right. So uh, here is a, a little case study. Uh, I don't know if you like uh, Greece and uh, <laughs> especially uh, mythology uh, because uh, I took some, some names. I mean, I did, we didn't want uh, to anonymize the company and we took uh, Vesta as a company name. And uh, Mrs. Ops, uh, uh, which is uh, the mother of Vesta in the Greek uh, uh, <laughs> mythology, just a little, uh, a little uh, joke. Uh, Vesta here is the company, um, and its founder and, and current CEO, Mrs. Ops, 
wants to retire. This is, of course, a subject we, we all know. Uh, it's uh, more and more uh, frequent um, because of the baby boomers are uh, trying to retire. And they, they are looking for a, a person, uh, a buyer, and to take control and, and, and give, the, give the torch to. Um, so basically, um, Mrs. Ops, uh, she doesn't have any, any person, in, uh, no one in the family who can t take up the torch, and, and she's looking for a buyer. So it can be either an industrial uh, counterpart, uh, a client, or a, a competitor. But it can also be outside, uh, in, uh, inside the company, sorry, uh, which is the management. In fact, uh, she has been working on this uh, succession issue for uh, several years, and the managers um, did face up with uh, more and more, uh, more and more work, and have been uh, have shown uh, great autonomy, especially during during her vacation, and she knows that uh, they are able to uh, to take the control. So uh, she prefers to, to sell to her managers. So uh, she's, uh, she has been considering conducting a leverage buyout. In fact, she has been advised by her CPA to do so. So we are going to look uh, how it works. Uh, so the comp templated LB LMBO, it's called LMBO, in fact. You have several types of LBOs, leverage buyouts. So, and uh, here it's uh, in, uh, the M, uh, stands for management, of course. So basically, it's the uh, current management within the company who's buying out and who's taking control of the company they work to. And in order to transfer smoothly the ownership, she wants to remain an active shareholder. And, and the managers, who uh, we will see in the next slide, but they have 30% uh, of the equity stake. And uh, the founder, Mrs. Ops, is uh, holding 70%. Uh, in this operation, the managers want to relute themselves, which means that they want to increase their uh, shareholding uh, up to uh, 50 plus, so as to be a majority, uh, to have a simple majority. So the management team is uh, uh, going uh, to see, uh, of course, the bankers, the current bankers of the company, and other uh, financial, potential financial partners. They are pulling resources together, uh, either equity and debt, to acquire the company, to have the fund necessary to, to, to do the operation. And as for uh, Mrs. Ops, Mrs. Ops, as I told you, she really wants to stay an active uh, uh, board member and shareholder. So the equation is like she wants to sell uh, a certain proportion. Uh, she wants to carry out a, a, a certain level of cash out, but she um, she wants to be a significant minority shareholder, but she wants to give ample room for the managers to have uh, to be reluted and to have the majority. So this is the kind of equation she's she's dealing with, and in fact she wants to sell around 80% of her shares, and she and, and wishes to keep, of course, the the rest, which is uh, the 20%, because she's very confident in the future of the company, and the market, and especially the managers. So a bit of context, some key figures. As I told you, you have 70% owned by uh, Mrs. Ops and 30% by the managers. And Vesta is a company uh, generating an EBITDA of uh, 3 million and a net result uh, uh, profit of 2 million. Vesta's current net debt is about 2 million. In fact, it's, uh, this is some data that we, it's, it's interesting because uh, we will see later how we calibrate the, the senior debt, for instance. So basically the company has three, three million total debts, financial debts, and one million in cash, and that gives you the, the two millions here. Um, and she has received um, unsolicited um, a letter of intents uh, of, uh, of several buyers, uh, one private equity fund, and, and uh, this, uh, um, I think it's not written, uh, the uh, competitor who has been valuating the company at 20 million. So, how do we do uh, uh, under this LMBO? Uh, what are the different steps? Um, what usually what we're, we're what we're going to do is we are setting up a new company, a holding company. So it's a financial company that will 
raise, of course, uh, the equity and and also debt, so as to finance to buy out 100% of Vesta. Uh, but in fact, we don't need to finance 100% because there are some, uh, uh, you see that the managers are bringing shares and also the founders. So the founders, uh, the, uh, Mrs. Ops is, um, is selling 80%, right? She's uh, transferring 20% of the of Vesta to the new co-company, to the new company takeover holding. And, and the managers uh, have a uh, 30% they are bringing also to the takeover uh, takeover company, takeover holding. All right. Um, so we have 6 million and 3 million, 9 million. And the, the equity value is 20 million. Basically, we have to, uh, to finance, um, it's, it's written on the next slide, but we have to finance like 50, 56%, which is, uh, yeah, uh, it's written right there, 11, 11 million. <laughs> I'm going too fast, right? <laughs> and, uh, so we have to finance 11 million. And uh, 11 millions, we are, uh, of course, we want to um, to look to, uh, to the bankers and then deal with the bankers so as to raise as much senior debt, uh, senior loan as possible but within the limits, of course, of the, the, the company. Um, and in fact, what, what do we look at uh, in order to calibrate this senior loan? We look at the net debt, the current net debt of 2 million. We look at the, uh, the EBITDA. Usually the bankers like uh, the leverage ratio, uh, for instance, which is the net debt over uh, the EBITDA. And this company is not a too big company, so it's, in a, it's an SME, usually you have a leverage of uh, three, four times maximum, uh, and here we are considering a leverage of three times the EBITDA, which is the uh, total debt, the two million that is not refinanced, and the eight million, the additional senior debt you raise for the, for the operation. And so we look at, the, uh, at the, the capacity of the company to pay back, to reimburse the debt, that is uh, that is solicited of, of course and and the current debt we have to look at the equity that has been raised so uh, as i told you the managers are bringing uh, uh, six million uh, founder three million this is in a share contribution and so so it's we have nine million here and uh, in order to finance uh, 100 percent of a company we need an additional three million uh, which is brought by the private equity fund. So in doing that, if we go back to the previous slide, sorry, we can see the capitalization table. Uh, the managers are holding the majority stakes of more than 50% here uh, with their 6 million uh, worth of shares. And, um, and the founder is at the same level of, uh, as the uh, private equity fund. So, yeah, no, no a little bit. Thank you. I think we almost done here. All right. I didn't miss anything. Good. If you have some question, please interact. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so here you have the. Um, how do we repay the, the the senior debt we have raised in the holding? It's the the target company Vesta is in fact uh, distributing dividends, which is a part of the benefit that go up to the uh, takeover holding. Uh, this is the dividend upstream you find here uh, uh, on the graphic and uh, so as to, to reimburse the um, annual repayment so each year usually you have a seven year maturity and uh, each year you have to uh, you, you can calibrate different uh, uh, periodicity but it's usually an annual uh, repayment and here uh, you have to uh, 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 distribute dividends enough so as to pay back the, the 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 senior loan, of course, and some fees you might have also in the holding. All right. Uh, so a part of the net result here is uh, fifty-seven percent. So fifty-seven percent. Um, this is the allocation. I mean, the, you use fifty-seven percent of your uh, net result to pay back the debt. That's uh, ample room for uh, progress, right? But if you consider that the company is also does have to pay back 
the current debt he, he, he raised before the operation, which is one or 0 0.6 million. It gives you a, a like two third of the a little bit a little bit uh, more than a two third of the uh, net results that go to the uh, reimbursement. So we have some um, some uh, extra room probably to raise more debt to finance, uh, for instance. Uh, 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 um, uh, the growth, uh, the current growth of the company, or uh, a new acquisition. All right. All right. Uh, very few words on the legal aspect of uh, such kind of transaction. Um, I, I won't be very long because I expect we have a, a lot of experts here in the in the in the room. Um, so here you just see a traditional, a typical timeline um, uh, which shows how uh, an LBO, such kind of transaction, um, uh, goes from A to Z on a legal point of view. Uh, I, won't, I will not comment further. Um, so in addition to setting up the SPV, uh, the legal structuring of an, of an LBO involves um, the drafting of a uh, huge and a lot and quite complex contractual documentation, uh, which are mainly related to, to three, three steps in, in the process. So you have first all the pre-contractual agreements um, which are of importance and where you also will find a due diligence process. You have all the agreements around the target acquisition, which is mainly SPA, but also all the financing documentation, which will be negotiated uh, at the same time. And uh, you have all the, the organization uh, of the corporate governance of the relation between the shareholders after the, the closing of the transaction. Um, the, the main points, um, which I would say are, are often very well discussed um, uh, in such transactions and in SPAs, are of course the price. How is it structured? Uh, is it a flat price? Uh, will we have price adjustments? Will we have earnouts? And these are probably the most important points for the buyer and the investors. Um, and these, these, these clauses need a close collaboration between lawyers and the financial uh, people who are involved in the transaction and the structuring of the transaction. Um, second big topic, topic will be the guarantees, um, which uh, will need to be given to the acquirer. Um, and there I would like to stress the importance of the due diligence work uh, which has to be done on the target group um, in order to identify the risks and to give uh, an appropriate answer to these risks and, and of comfort also to, the, to, to investors. Uh, because they, they will ask for. Um, what we can generally say is that drafting such kind of documentation from a legal standpoint has in the last uh, yeah, two decades or three decades became very um, complex. So it's really a matter of specialists. What I mean by this, it's, um, it's always nice to have the historical advisors on such deals because they know the group companies, uh, they know uh, mo uh, most of the time or very well also the owners and the sellers, but please bear in mind that it will be very important to have people on financial side, on legal side, who, 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 who really have this know-how because it's a special know-how to, to, to draft such kind of uh, documentation. Um, afterwards, uh, last big topic it's topics will be, uh, of course, uh, shareholder rights, uh, which are structured through a shareholder agreement traditionally, and uh, where you will find classical rights like drag along, tag along, um, exit clauses, and also treatment of all the manager and operational shareholders. Uh, where you will need call option with good lever, bad lever, vesting, uh, etc. Um, and, and there also we will set forth all the rules for the governance structure. You might have some special committees, some veto rights, some some all such thing. And in Luxembourg we have a quite a um, a fairly good corporate law allowing to do um, really 
tailor-made agreements uh, which reflect um, the agreements and the economical agreement between the parties. So that's a big good point for Luxembourg. Um, and uh, besides doing all this, which is a huge uh, work, <clears throat> you, we will of course need to negotiate all the finance agreements, uh, which is also a big part because uh, that's our, these agreements are also quite technical and all the securities which will be need, needed and required for, from the, the finance, um, the, the, the different financing parties uh, in, in, in such a transaction. And to finish, and then I think we should go to the questions to the panel because I expect them to, 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 to be very interesting. Um, so first, do, do not underestimate or neglect the pre-contractual steps and especially due diligence work because uh, often what we see in, or in our practice is that it may take unexpected time and it m sometimes delay um, transaction, transactions. Um, <clears throat> do not forget that it's a complex process involving many persons, so it, uh, there will be a, a huge uh, need of coordination of all the involved persons. And um, a, a last word, there, is, there are financial, financial requirements, legal complexity, but there is one major factor which is also very important, is the human aspect, uh, and especially when we're talking about SMEs. So um, one should always um, um, uh, think that you need to surround uh, themselves with, with people who are one able to uh, structure technically the economic agreement but uh, who is also able to coordinate and to manage all the human aspects of such kind of transactions. And uh, for the very last word, to be very clear, it's a, it's a, it's a big process which involves uh, for the management uh, and the owners a huge effort. And, and uh, the feedback I gained from, from all the owners I could advise is it, that it's really a job on top of a job. And it's a very, very intense period uh, that usually lasts between six and 12 months before we achieve a closing. And yeah, that will be my end word. And uh, maybe, Stefan, if you would like to add. So, Anna and Charles Henri, thanks a lot for this very pragmatic presentation, particularly like the business case. I think that's really interesting to integrate that in our training academy. And now then, as you propose, let's move then to our panel. Uh, let's call then uh, Xavier Bouc, then from EuroDNS, uh, Samuel Claire also from We Invest Capital Partners, and then Philippe Augustin from BGL BNP Paribas, and uh, Frédéric Cassani from Bill Corporate Finance. Since you all know now uh, Anna and Charles-Henri already, uh, gentlemen, would it be possible to quickly introduce yourself, starting with uh, Xavier? Thank you. My name is Xavier Bach. I'm an entrepreneur here in Luxembourg, Luxemburger. I created a couple of companies in the internet space, uh, starting with Data Center Luxembourg, and then EuroDNS Domain Registrar, and growing all over Europe by doing quite a lot of M&A in Europe, and even outside of Europe in the domain and hosting industry. Uh, I'm an uh, independent uh, board member in different funds. Uh, the one for the topic today actually is because I'm also in funds of small startups. That's not for the topic today. But it's uh, HLD is the one since eight years as independent board member at HLD, where a lot of uh, nice uh, structuring and a lot of uh, leverage uh, buyout and other structures uh, have been used. Thank you. So hello, good afternoon, my name is Philip, working uh, for BGL now for the last 18 years, most of the time in the corporate banking department and my actual job is to uh, develop a private equity activity, activity at BGL in here in Luxembourg and uh, in previous experience in the corporate banking department I had uh, some experience with LBOs. Hello, my name is uh, Samuel Claire, I'm managing partner at uh, WeInvest Capital Partners. Uh, so what we do at we invest we invest we invest in equities um, and um, we have um, we have developed um, a fund a rife 
for a different strategy, which is uh, real estate strategies. But we also make some club deals, um, especially buyouts. So we like to invest as a majority stakeholder. Um, this is what I've done in my previous career um, as investment director for a small cap funds, but also um, as an investment manager for at the European Investment Fund, so knowing the private equity market in Europe. And uh, we also have a, a consulting activity aside of, uh, of the investment part. Hello, good afternoon. It works? Yeah? Okay, thanks. Uh, so I'm Fred, I'm in charge of the big corporate finance activity for BI Group in Luxembourg. Uh, I've been working in the financial uh, industry for about uh, 70 years in Luxembourg, in France, in the UK a bit. Uh, I'm in charge of developing uh, this corporate finance activity, which is uh, a combination of lending activity, mainly acquisition financing, such as LBOs, and also the uh, corporate finance uh, advisory activity, which is mainly an investment banking activity on the uh, on the uh, financial advisory, so thank you. Good, so the scene has been set, clarified. Let's now tackle those different uh, questions we prepared and very happy afterwards to take yours. So, Philippe, are LBOs suitable for all types of businesses? Well, my answer would be no, uh, because I think as a business you should meet a couple of criteria to be a potential candidate for an LBO. First one would be, it should be a profitable business, actually. Second, if you're profitable, usually you are uh, generating cash or cash flows. Those cash flows are supposed to be used to repay your existing bank loans, but also to finance your growth, meaning uh, finance your networking capital or your capex. If after having financed your growth, so networking capital, capex, uh, and you're repaid your existing bank loans, there's still free cash flows, you may consider an LBO. If on the opposite side, if you're a startup and you are in a potentially in a cash burn situation, meaning that you use more cash than you generate, I think don't waste your time considering such an option. Everybody's on the same line. Anybody would like to add anything? I think, yes, you, you're right. It's a question of um, <coughs> stage of maturity. Um, because, yes, the company has to be profitable. This is. This is the minimum requirement, and uh, LBO doesn't apply to to startups, uh, obviously. I, I would even add that it must be so stable for years, and and it must be stable to potential crisis. Because if next crisis jumps in and uh, you you would your cash flow would would go down, you will be far fast in trouble. So it must be really only for structures that have a long history of, of strong cash flow. Okay, that seems to be a clear answer on that. So if we continue then, um, are companies under LBO better structured and managed finally? What do you think, Samuel? I think um, <clears throat> there are many different ways to, to address this question, uh, depending on what kind of buyer we have in front of us. Um, I'm talking about uh, LMBO, as you said earlier, for example, existing management, try to take over the company as a, as a majority shareholder um, or financial funds, or, but also a um, industrial player. So um, if we take the example of the, um, of the existing management, um, probably um, I would say that the propensity to um, develop structure and, um, and, and, and better manage the, the company is, I would say, a bit lower. This is my opinion. Because the, the existing manager is already inside the company and uh, the culture and the organization are already embedded in this, uh, uh, within, within this, uh, this management. And I guess this management has uh, been part of this uh, uh, inception, uh, implementation of the culture, etc. But um, uh, for industrial player, I would say it's a bit different because um, the acquired company will be uh, integrated within a group and uh, it may benefit from the group, um, organization, management layers, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So I guess we will obtain more synergies and 
and better reporting, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is very important. And the last one, um, the financial sponsor, for example, the buyout fund. Um, this one will have probably a different view and a different approach in, uh, based on its investment strategy. Uh, if it's an active fund, for example, it may bring some specificities and new elements to, um, uh, to pursue the company and, uh, and, uh, and, follow, it, and follow it to the, to the next stage. Um, but we also have some sparing partners, for example, at we invest, we like to be involved in the company and we'll, we, we, we like to, to have some uh, interesting discussion about the, about the different angle we have uh, with the commercial approach, but also the organization or, or I don't know, for example, the financial, uh, uh, the financial elements. So yes, it's, um, um, it's another angle, but also very interesting to, to better manage and to better structure the, the company. Maybe just from a, a strictly legal point of view, uh, in my experience, experience um, it, the structure is enhanced because you have uh, the corporate governance, uh, which is uh, put in place in the in the in the SPV in the acquisition holding, and you will of course also have reporting obligations to the banks, uh, typically, uh, which sometimes uh, will. Uh, uh, um, require from the company to organize this reporting and, and to and thus to better organize and structure the activity. But that's on the legal and financial standpoint, not operational point of view. Thanks. And we also like a lot, I mean, and it's not a concept, this process of value creation, as also seen on the slide, to work both on the financial angle, but also operational, organizational, and then as you highlighted, uh, Yes, exactly. exactly. Anna and uh, Charlerie mentioned, the, sp the, 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 the let's say, the sparing partners. It's a very uh, a great movement in, uh, in Europe. Um, <clears throat> this is a very interesting way because the sparing partners can spend a lot of time within the company, with the management, aside from the management, um, to, to, to develop the company and, um, and to, the, to the next stage. Uh, for example, with the internationalization of sales, but also with, let's, let's say, the professionalism. This is uh, hiring new CEO, new CFO, meaning um, ready for the next stage. Um, but also um, <clears throat> a lot of different um, elements like uh, digitalization, which is a very, uh, also an important topic. How can we digitalize the company? and providing a lot of IT tools, very uh, uh, important to, to improve the efficiency. Yes. Great examples. Um, now it's also in the presentation before, uh, an example with a private equity fund. So is the contribution of uh, such fund essential to secure an LBO transaction? Xavier, what do you think? Um, it's not an obligation, of course, there are other players. But I think that it's a good choice, depending what you want to do. To have really, especially if it's an active uh, private equity fund, in pri an active pri private equity fund would come in and actually would immediately during the negotiation and the due diligence process already work on the strategy, on where to move on and how to continue to grow. Because the problem is that an LBO comes with an, a cash pressure on the structure and so the future growth can, okay, just organic growth market, that's nice. But then a PE actually would like more than just organic growth and market growth. So he would come in and already with the management together look into what are we going next? What, uh, which markets do you want to go? Which m and do you want to do? And so on. And they would already then negotiate together how to achieve that in, in the process. So if it's just for managers to go and get more equity and feel comfortable than no PE, but if sir, they really want to be more aggressive and have really a partner on their side, then definitely go for PE. A bit, as mentioned by Samuel, also the sparing partners and also extra intelligence you can get then in the equation. Absolutely. I fully agree because um, um, a private equity fund uh, has to be seen as a partner. And um, 
okay, it will provide equity portion, which is quite uh, needed in, the, in an LBO circumstance. But um, it can also, uh, as you mentioned, uh, provide more equity for add-on acquisitions for, um, for, uh, for, for a build-up program, for example, but also in case of difficulties. This is very important to mention, because in case of difficulties with an, uh, during an LBO process, it's more stressful, let's say. And uh, it may also provide more equity uh, if we need uh, some additional capex. So yes, it has to be seen as a very important partner and not just a funding partner. And now let's, for example, imagine that we are exiting through an LBO with a financial sponsor. And do you think that you will get then also fair market value of your assets, Xavier? <laughs> That's a, a tricky one because in <coughs> Charles Henry's presentation, we saw that mostly it's uh, managers who are the one who are doing an LBO. So on one hand, then the, the managers have a fiduciary duty to get the maximum price for its shareholders, but on the other hand, they have are incentivized to buy maybe not that expensive. So there, of course, as shareholder, you must be uh, very and, and be with on, on the negotiations and not just let your, your managers uh, manage all that and make sure. But otherwise, I would say yes. So because you saw in the presentation of Charles Henry, you saw that uh, the PE that came in with 3 million, he got 25%. But normally, 3 million on, t on 20 million valuation is only 15%. So actually, in the end, uh, entering in a deal in a leverage buyout uh, gives you an, a better return of investment and is normally a good deal for you as, as a PE and allows you as shareholders selling that the PE that comes in would make a higher offer and everybody would make a higher offer price because their return of investment is higher. So as a shareholder, you should be able to get a better price in, in such a deal. And in the end, it's also an alignment of interest for sure, but uh, sometimes a little bit more complex. Yes, that's a tricky one. But then the shareholder is responsible to follow that and then know his managers well and mot motivate them. Well, probably in addition, uh, generally uh, industrial uh, groups pay higher prices than PE. But it used to be the case. It's not always the case. Uh, you have some uh, indexes uh, on the uh, uh, multiples paid by the, the PE industry. There is, a, for instance, Argos Soditic, which is an index of, or rather on SMEs, uh, probably mid-cap companies more. And now we can see that um, uh, at uh, to 2018, uh, the multiple paid in, on average was eight times the EBITDA, and now it's more 10, 11 times the EBITDA. So there is a, a fierce competition uh, within the, the private equity industry because there is a lot of dry powder, a lot of uh, committed money that is not invested yet. And uh, <laughs> they are willing to pay a little more, I would say, <laughs> currently. So, um, so in fact, the, the gap, the, the price gap, uh, the valuation gap between the industry and the PEs is, is getting thinner, I would say. Thank you for those uh, additional details. Uh, Frédéric, do you share the view that too much leverage is the first reason of LBA failures? Uh, that's a tough question, I think. Uh, to be fair, uh, we have to be very uh, careful on this and cautious because, of course, uh, the level of leverage is a key element. But uh, as a real uh, actor in this uh, financing uh, operation, I think uh, um, the key point is not only the level of the leverage, it's also the, the debt profile of the transaction. And to be fair, on the SME market, there is a standard. Uh, meaning that most of the transactions on the SME markets are below uh, f uh, four times EBDA multiple. So there is not that much leverage as we could uh, imagine. Uh, but of course, it's a key element, but not the only one. I believe that um, the leverage is only a tool for the transaction. And why? Because um, if the company meets some, di some difficulties, um, to honor its uh, annuity, uh, I'm pretty sure the financial sponsor and the banks and and, uh, and the private debt funds, for example, uh, will be able to find a solution um, and to postpone the the annuity and, and avoid the default. 
Uh, but the question is, uh, why uh, and where is it coming from? What is the difficulty? Is there any turnaround in the market? Is there any inefficiencies in the company itself? Where is it coming from? Because the leverage is a tool, and if you uh, can find the solution regarding your, um, let's say, uh, organic uh, um, layout, uh, it will be very difficult to uh, honor your uh, the the coupon and the reimbursement. I would say that uh, uh, the uh, indebtedness is not the root of all evil. In fact, it's just, uh, for me, it's much, much more a catalyst. When there is a problem within the company, it just accelerates the problem. Because the more debt you have, the more pressure you have to be profitable, so to increase the cash flow in order to pay the, the probably uh, too much debt uh, that has been uh, uh, set up uh, uh, at the beginning, so the, we we have some examples, of course, of, of big LBOs that uh, that, fa that failed. Uh, I have, for instance, uh, Toys R Us in mind. We all know this uh, uh, Toys R Us. Uh, it has been a very uh, a huge success for many many years, and in fact, the, uh, when it went from uh, one hand uh, one one private equity, equity owner to uh, another, which was, uh, if I remember correctly, Bain Capital to uh, KKR, the problem was not uh, just about the debt, uh, about the choices they, they made. Uh, of course, KKR uh, uh, tried to uh, cut on the uh, on the expenses on the uh, on the payroll. But uh, they were facing huge challenges uh, because within the toy business uh, they were, uh, of course, uh, competing with the Chinese, with uh, many different actors, and it was moving fast. So it was not the only problem, I would say. Um, I have a, 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 an example uh, of my own, uh, from, from my experience uh, in France, which is uh, one of the uh, leader of the um, cleaning uh, uh, products. Um, this group, uh, in fact, was doing a lot of buyouts, paying uh, dearly the uh, the targets with a high leverage every time. But they did not have... Um, they had a good strategy, I would say, but they did not uh, implement a real integration team. And in fact, they lost many uh, talents and uh, sometimes sales representatives that were... Uh, 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 really holding big clients, so they were losing sales, they were losing uh, uh, the, the profit level was going d down and they had too much difficulties to pay, to pay the debt and in fact it went bankrupt uh, and, and then finally uh, uh, they were sold to uh, uh, <laughs> the biggest competitor of the sector. But uh, So it's a, a true story and, uh, and the, to me the, the, the debt was a problem of course that, but there were more problems within the company that they, they were that they did not f uh, really uh, pay attention too much on it. Um, that's it. Maybe uh, if I can add a few words on that, not on, on this case, but uh, when you we build the I mean the financial models and we do stress uh, in a bank or with a debt funds, uh, I think that what, what is really important is in, in, in the headroom. It's always the, the key element, how flexibility, how much flexibility we have in a, in a stress case scenario. Uh, and then we have to build also the, the debt profile. I mean, in the SME market for LBOs, uh, what is uh, the usual cases? We've got half percent of amortizing debt and half percent on the bullet trench. That's typically the type of transaction we have to, to, to make sure that there is a kind of flexibility and not stress that much the financial model. And if there is some buy and build strategy, very aggressive strategy on, on the European market or any kind of sector, I mean, what we have to make sure, uh, I mean, uh, with all parties, <laughs> including the banks, uh, debt funds, and manager and shareholders, is to have the adapted, uh, I mean, uh, debt profile. And if you are more and more buy and build strategy, in a buy and build strategy, you have to, to, to move to a full bullet profile. That's the only key element. And we add uh, in such a financing some cash ship, uh, uh, definite, uh, definite clause uh, that could be a, a real, uh, I mean, a, a real um, good choice in terms of um, flexibility uh, for everyone in such transaction. So that's very important to adapt the case on the, on the strategy. So financial is a tool, 
financial model is a tool, but uh, very uh, close to the strategy. That's very important. And having some room, uh, it's a key element for everyone. We also understood before that, uh, let's say, an LBO target should be uh, profitable. But what about if it's not really operationally well structured? Samuel, what in your, in your view would be the tips and tricks in order to prep such uh, LBO target? Um, <clears throat> how I can say? Um, who, can, who can do more, can do less? So, I mean, if, um, if, an, uh, if an LBO is, uh, is possible with a uh, not well-established uh, company, uh, a slight improvement is a plus. So I, uh, I strongly encourage the potential buyer to make a maturity assessment of the company um, to better understand the, the, the strengths of the company, but of course also the weaknesses. Uh, for example, let's, um, let's say the, uh, the workforce, try to understand if all employees are properly involved in the, the entire process but also to understand the management layers and maybe the matrix of um, responsibilities and abilities within the company itself. Um, the company uh, may also uh, start uh, implementing some uh, monitoring, reporting, KPI, meeting minutes also, which is important. Um, and the, the the management has also to uh, to have an open mindset uh, because he will uh, share the responsibilities of the entire company with the new partners, sometimes new partners. And this is very important uh, to have an open mindset because uh, those partners uh, may sometimes challenge the, the management, try to provide some new insight and a different angle, different point of view. So this is important to, to have an open mindset, uh, get ready for the transaction. And uh, yes, I think uh, uh, all the rest is, uh, should be provided during the transaction itself uh, with, for example, the sparing partners, but also for the bank, because um, um, we will have a lot of, of information to share with those people. And uh, it may be quite new for the manager to share some information uh, with the external uh, fund provider, but also internally, because I think it's important for the cohesion to share some new elements internally and to, um, to, to see the company as a whole. And because, uh, because the LBO is a, is a long journey, I think it's, uh, the, the average holding period is uh, almost six years, so it's uh, 5.8 years of holding period, so it's a long journey. And uh, yes, everyone has to be uh, on the same page. Uh, my experience when a PE jumps in, during the due diligence, of course, he analyzes a team and looks how it's structured. What you don't want to touch most cases is uh, the main manager, <laughs> not at least not at the beginning. And you don't want to touch too much the, the sales director. You don't want to influence too much. So it's mostly on the CFO side where it's not well structured enough. And then it comes on the marketing and especially on the digital strategy for to go internet and more digital where the, the accents are. So that's my experience. Okay, and maybe just um from a legal standpoint and to, to go back, to circle back to what I've said uh, previously about the due diligence process. Um, the, uh, during this process, um, the company should also very um, precisely identify its, its weaknesses uh, on, on client agreements or employment agreements or, or, or tax uh, issues. Um, to 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 have them in mind and to 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 give adequate uh, answers and safeguards to a new investor, and to avoid unnecessary and, and not very nice discussion uh, around guarantees um, and other topics you will often find in SMEs is uh, to have a look on all the specific advantage which um, might be granted to people who are related to the owner 
uh, that's a big classical. Um, and to just to to have a look uh, on these advantages like cars or apartments which are rented for not market value uh, wages and and just to consider the, the the tax issues which arise from this and and to have them in mind and to know them and if possible to to, to get this uh, fairly and documented and uh, before the due diligence And uh, Philippe, uh, do you have an idea why sometimes LBOs have such a bad press? Well, I, I think this is mainly related to LBO transactions which have been done in the past, like in, let's say in the 80s, where investors believed that the simplest, the simplest and easiest way to generate, create value is uh, to pile up as much debt as you can and to restructure the company, so like a, a golden gecko type of investor. Um, I, I found this, a graph, which I think is on the next slide, which might be interesting to help answer that question. And it's actually a graph which tries to explain or to give you a breakdown of the value created by uh, private equity transactions uh, between, the between the 80s to 2012. And um, what struck me is that in the 1980s, you have like... 51% of the value created in, in a private equity transaction comes from the leverage effect, which totally confirms what I was saying before. And this has completely changed because nowadays the leverage effect only contributes to or explains 13% of the value created in a, in a PE transaction. 39% is uh, well, quite stable between the, the 80s and 2012. That's the increase of multiples. And the big part, the 48% now comes from value creation, operational efficiency gains, which uh, you can get from a PE investor. So my conclusion here would be that, uh, well, I think PE investors do create value for SMEs as well. Yeah, and Gordon Gecko went to prison due to insider trading and uh, barbarians at the gate. That's not now the must anymore. So uh, as just presented, we want operational value creation and uh, different, uh, let's say, examples as cited before by Samuel. Um, for example, unlike our neighbors, why are, let's say, LBOs not, uh, let's say, liked as much uh, in Luxembourg? For, let's say, if we take the SME angle, can you tell us that a little bit, uh, Frédéric? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, to be honest, uh, we, we don't have a, a real statistic on, on that. First, we have to, to, to acknowledge uh, there is no r real uh, metrics on that. But uh, from my perspective, because it's my own opinion and it's much more about, much more about my feeling, I think it's a family-owned business market, as we could say in Luxembourg. Uh, there is a lot of families, and uh, to me, it's very similar to the Swiss market. So families, uh, they don't want to, to, to sell their assets. They want to keep their assets uh, in their family and find uh, an internal solution. So this is mainly, I would say, the, the first uh, reason of that but maybe you can share your view, uh, Xavier, if you want. I, yes. Well, actually, it looks at what you look at. There are many PEs in, in Luxembourg that do a lot of LBOs, but they do it internationally. So I probably statistic-wise, we are one of the countries with the most. But uh, when we come the other side around and look at Luxembourgish uh, businesses that, that do an LBO, I think it's uh, two things. It's It's how many companies we have of a critical size. I don't know if that uh, small companies uh, are not really, you don't do too much uh, LBOs on, on small companies one side, and then as you said, family business. And um, good question. I, I don't have the answer. I think it's a matter of size of, of the country and, and as you said, families. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's about the, the market. Uh, I mean, uh, it's not a deeper market as uh, we've got uh, in Germany or in France. Uh, the size of the country, of course, it's, uh, it's kind of a barrier limit. But we, I think uh, we can discuss about that uh, after this uh, panel uh, with uh, Robert, which is uh, one of the, the, the key players on that side. He was a seller uh, with uh, Stoltrack. Um, and I think we've got some nice example in the Luxembourgish market, of course. Uh, but uh, it's still growing. 
Well, I think right. it's also a little bit our Luxembourgish banks maybe who are not pushing in that direction. Yeah, that's, also. Good. that's a good, that's a good they, point. I think uh, they, I they prefer to give yeah. a personal loan so to the good. future yeah, to the future buyer and and hook him hook him in personally too. Huh? I think. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think about banks, uh, and uh, I work for a bank. Uh, BIL is a systemic bank in Luxembourg, and I can discuss about this point if you want a uh, you know, one-to-one -one meeting or after this panel. But I think there is no real barrier uh, in each bank uh, and in nowadays. Uh, what we've got, to, what we have to, to to have in mind that the BCE put some leverage guidance for bank, for Spokes, for uh, BNPP, for BIL. So we've got a, a lovely regulator. So remind uh, you have to we, we have to remind that there is some guidance and it's a public guidance. You can go to their website, BCE website, and I think uh, we have to consider that. And uh, banks and maybe we will move to that subject at the end of this uh, panel. Banks are not the only solution to to to, to do LBOs uh, in terms of debt providers. So we'll discuss about this case maybe. Maybe I can add something because um, <coughs> we invest capital partner is a small boutique. And we have a small funds uh, based in Luxembourg, so the, the, and the investment team is also in Luxembourg. And um, what what we have is um, yeah, the, the the private equity industry in Luxembourg is obviously very well developed, but more as a hub, uh, investing in in Europe, but at least abroad, and. Um, and um, for example, we don't have the critical size to be fully uh, integrated in the ecosystem um, because uh, in Luxembourg it's more largest deal and largest private equity boutique. So uh, it's um, um, if you are too small, it, it's very difficult, I would say. And uh, I believe for SMEs it's almost the same because you're, you're too small to attract a, a biggest player. So th this is my uh, this is my point of view. It's like uh, we need to we need to attract more uh, initiative and uh, emerging players uh, within the territory. And that's why we are so happy to have uh, let's say firms like uh, Samuel, Xavier, and also Charles Henri here in Luxembourg taking the decision that that's also a little bit a part of the Luxembourg future of the financial hub. Also to work really on that more front office and potentially also uh, in the meantime also this investor relations hub. So those are kind of missions the association would like to, to push further. But just also comment uh, each year when we go with Louis to the Super Return Conference and then they're always talking about the Mittelstand in Germany. Uh, when we talk to such GPs they also say that's not that easy uh, let's say in comparison. So yes uh, the question was kind of uh, pushing it. It's complicated but uh, it's not also just a paradise everywhere. So you need lots of contacts, lots of years and uh, lots of perseverance before entering also that market. Frederick, you highlighted before something very interesting, yes? So as a banker, can you tell us, except for banks, uh, who could then help out in order to finance such business transfers? Uh, I think if we talk about uh, different typology of lenders, this is the question I think you want to cover here, uh, in, if, I, if I understand the question. Um, of course, banks... Uh, are uh, one of the solution uh, that's uh, the historical uh, player around the LBOs because without any leverage you, you cannot make uh, your investment thesis. So basically you need liquidity. <laughs> but as we said, banks uh, are good for some reasons, but from time to time they are not very, uh, I mean, they don't have that much appetite, as you said, uh, Xavier, for many reasons. Uh, it could be about sector, it could be about the management, it could be about the leverage of the transaction, it could be about pricing. So we need a, a fair balance, and uh, also there is a, a long process of decision from, from some banks. From time to time, we have to admit that, and uh, that's the reality of the market. And for that, I think there is other solution. I mean, uh, unit change financing is a good solution, and uh, as a financial <coughs> advisor uh, for uh, as BIL corporate finance, this is what we do. Uh, not only uh, on the lending side, as a lending as, as a lender, but as a financial advisor, we do advise. I mean, management, shareholders, to, to at least to think about this uh, scenario using a unit on financing for LBOs. Uh, that's very interesting. And also in terms of, uh, I mean, the, the solution is a bit different. Uh, banks are very, I would say, dogmatic because that's a lovely regulatory environment. 
Um, but debt funds are more flexible in terms of leverage, <coughs> in terms of debt profile, in terms of pricing, in terms of uh, buy and bin strategy, because they can buy uh, the future of the strategy, also future acquisition financing, which is very important. That's also a way to consider uh, having some LBO financing, not only with banks, but, already, but also with debt funds. And from time to time, we can combine the two solution in one solution. This is what we do also uh, as a financial advisor to make sure we can provide the, the, the right solution for the right scenario. That's very important to anticipate that. And from time to time, it's also good for, I mean, uh, LBO players to have a, a dual tracks. So having a first uh, a real request uh, over the banks, uh, local players, or maybe international players also, that could be a, a good solution here in Luxembourg, but also discussing with uh, Unitranch finance, uh, Financer, uh, that's a, a lovely um, way to, to have a good comparison. Hopefully it helps a bit. Tell me. <laughs> Anyone else on, on that one? No. I'm quite confident about the, <coughs> the private actor as well. Yes, um, the private debt, uh, he, let's say, is booming, uh, and, uh, and you know that at uh, LPEA. Um, so we have some emerging players um, having the possibility to inject uh, <coughs> and, uh, some uh, some money in the in the transaction. But uh, we still need banks and we still need equity. So it's uh, let's say it's. Uh, a compound uh, magic uh, formula. Yeah, that, that's uh, a really good element, and it, it's all about the the, the, the dilution scenario. Uh, but uh, for Unitrans uh, financing, uh, just to, to remind you that uh, it's a pure uh, senior loan, so without any dilution effect. So, which is good for the management. It's, it's good for the shareholders. So that's also important to to know that uh, in the capital. Uh, I mean, uh, in the capital structure, you've got a lot of solution. Uh, pure equity, quasi equity, senior senior financing, and uh, for that there is, um, I mean, many players around that. So it's not only a, bil a traditional bilateral discussion with your banker. So you need to be open and make sure you you can find the right solution. Great, thanks a lot for the different insights. And now we are moving on to the famous Q and A section. Do you have? Any question to our panelists right now? I have a hidden one. If nobody wants to start, it would be ah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate um, all of you. I think you've uh, made an excellent presentation, and I also believe that it's a presentation which is not overdue, but certainly it's good, it's good that you're doing it now. I think one of the problems why so few transactions take place is because the managers or the CEOs, the patriarchs as I call them, of small businesses are simply not aware of structured organizations such as what you've been describing. And furthermore, if you explain them to them, which is what you're trying to do this evening, I think that's a very good thing. It is very, very complicated. And I think a lot of managers of small businesses will take fright. Um, the manager of a small business has probably been successful. He's got to be successful because if his company isn't successful, then your model isn't going to work. So let's assume his company is successful. Well, he's been very successful at, uh, I don't know, <coughs> producing spaghetti or shoelaces or something else but his speciality is not at all doing structured financial deals. So this is an entirely different world, and um, you folks have to address this problem, and I think you're doing a very good job this evening, but I think that's one of the big, big, big problems. Um, and I just explained all the legal aspects. Uh, the guy who's producing spaghetti, he doesn't know anything, and all this, these words, just the wording, is going to possibly put him off. He's going to take fright, possibly. So it, that's, I think, a big problem. Uh, just one other thing. It's a little bit difficult for me here to talk about private equity, which uh, is a wide subject, of course. Um, but um, I think I'd like to qualify, perhaps, the uh, advantages of investment funds. They are there. You've explained them this evening. 
Uh, but if nobody contradicts anything that you've said, well, it's not going to be especially exciting. If everybody is in agreement, well, it's, uh, as the French say, du choc des idées jaillit l'étincelle. So there won't be a spark if we don't say anything different. And I think I'd like to point out there are lots of disadvantages of um, private equity funds. And um, in a constructive manner, I think these ought to be addressed. One thing which I find regretful is that we're talking all the time of creating value. Whose value are we creating or whom are we creating value for? Certainly the private investment funds, definitely. They are first come, first served, and they make sure that that's the way it works. The second thing is um, that, how should I say? We've talked this evening a lot about finances and creating value. One word that hasn't been mentioned, or at least I've overheard it, is ethical values. Do ethics play any role at all in this story? I think they do. I think there are lots of CEOs, retiring patriarchs, who are very keen on passing on their baby, but in a positive manner for their employees, for their top managers. And a lot of these CEOs will be willing to accept a lower price if it allows them to pass on the leadership, pass on the torch, if you like, to their own managers. And I think this is something which really ought to be addressed. It's got to be a win-win situation for everybody, not only for private investment funds. And I think a lot of managers who would like to sell their companies, if you can, if you can package it in such a manner that their own employees are going to gain as well, well, that's a good thing. Now, in the model you presented this evening, you suggest that uh, arithmetically, 30% uh, of the capital is going to be provided by the managers. That sounds good. But I think this is another problem which has to be addressed. And of course, Anna and Charles-Henri know it very well. The problem is that generally the employees in a company, well, they've been working for the company for some number of years, and they do not have any cash or very little cash. They've bought a house or an apartment or whatever, and they're financing this. They've got credit from Frederick or from, uh, <laughs> from uh, Johnny here or someone else, and they're paying off their loan. They do not have any excess cash. And uh, if the company has a sort of reasonable value, they simply will not have enough money to uh, provide 30% of the capital. And I think here a very interesting point is that it is not so important that they have the cash themselves. If they, what is important is that they have cash which is important to themselves, but not necessarily in relation to the company that they're buying. Uh, even if each of them can go along and find their grandma or their aunt or their local bank or whatever and uh, get some more money, not much, but by their own terms for them themselves, it's a lot. This is going to cement their relationship between themselves and it's going to increase the chances very considerably that they're going to stick together and they're going to do a very good job later on. So the managers who are going to join the capital of the company, they don't need to have 30% of the capital because generally they won't. What they have to have is they've got to scrape enough money together, which for them is important, even if it is not very important in relation to the total value of the company. There are a number of other points, but I think I'd better shut up now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Boyo. Thanks a lot, Robert, for all those observations, this feedback, uh, these compliments, and also those challenges. That's very important. Uh, how do you want to deal with that now? ESG, potentially, the financing? Or, or, or the PE. So I'm, I'm shareholder in, in, in many startups. I invested in many startups and, and as a board member of the a PE, uh, the PEs are not the devil and the shareholder is not the devil. So in this scenario that was on the screen, actually the 30% the of the managers that they brought were shares that they already got before 
for being manager. So that was in mostly they already saw, and this 30% came through the leverage buyout became 50.1%. In reality, though, it's very rare that the managers get to majority. So when PEs come in, it's normally PEs that get the majority, at least in HLD. So, uh, but but still, the the managers. The PE is hand in hand with the management. So they need to have the management on their side. So it's really a win-win scenario. So it's really the management, we, the PE makes sure the management gets percentages. In most cases, it has been negotiated. Actually, the PE, by investing, gave even more percentages to the management to get more motivated. And they made sure that all the C-levels got uh, percentages, while in most cases, the other C-levels don't have percentages. But when the PE comes in, they want to make sure the entire team is motivated. And, and, really, and then they come and they start negotiating what is the growth strategy. We can even bring more capital to do more M&A and so on. So it's really hand in hand. It, it's not working if a shareholder or an investor is not working hand in hand with the team. Then if the team is gone, your money is gone. Um, <coughs> absolutely right. Um, I think the, um, the best way to, um, to, to have a response on, on this approach is uh, probably the uh, legal engineering and the financial en engineering we can uh, provide around the around the transaction itself we have a lot of um, response uh, with the legal aspect uh, such as the incentive uh, program of course uh, the option to buy some shares at a very very low price etc uh, especially for the for the management to be uh, to, to get involved in the deal and uh, to make a win-win scenario yes and I would also come back um, on, the, on your first reaction regarding um, <clears throat> the lack of, uh, let's say, education. And we know that we are every day on the, on the field with, uh, w with the different actors here. Um, try to promote the private equity uh, at the smallest level than we all know in Luxembourg. Try to promote the benefits we can provide you as an entrepreneur. And this is a, a very long way to uh, to to, uh, to to convince the entrepreneur that uh, private equity funds are not the one they was to be. And maybe if I if I can uh, I can add a few 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 points on what you said, Robert. I said Robert because I, I know you a bit. Um, I think in terms of accessibility, it's important to, to, to have a, a large panel of, uh, I mean, uh, experts. And I think uh, most of them are, are here and we've got also nice uh, players here in this room. And um, having a financial advisor is a key element. And uh, as you did uh, a few years ago with your uh, LMBO transaction, uh, thanks to your management, so you, you've got a nice management uh, at the uh, short track level. Um, I mean, when you don't do that much deal, I mean, it's the first time for yourself, for yourself, uh, a kind of inaugural transaction. You need financial advisors wi without any conflict of interest. It's good to discuss with, uh, of course, uh, private equity uh, players. It's good to discuss with lawyers, of course. Uh, it's necessary, but uh, having uh, um, financial advisors uh, could be uh, very helpful, I think. And I think here in Luxembourg, you've got a lot of players. To be honest, you've got a nice big four, uh, big four companies uh, that could be also a great help. Um, you've got now uh, big corporate finance also. That's uh, no, a new option uh, on the market, uh, on the market, on the market. Pardon, uh, coming from bank. But uh, I think uh, that's um, very important to share experience. That could be also you. I mean, the key uh, element, uh, giving uh, your experience uh, with the other new potential new players on the uh, LBO market. And having such, uh, I mean, uh, history, uh, it's very helpful uh, for for new players. So thank you for that. And uh, I think uh, every uh, everyone here in Luxembourg are very keen uh, to to discuss and accessible. Um, that's the uh, chance uh, to to work on this market. Um, that's uh, one of the, I mean, uh, key assets uh, in this country. And Anna, anything we could do in order to simplify uh, SPAs, SHAs? <laughs> Um, 
no, but I think I would circle back to what I said uh, before, and um, uh, Robert knows it. I think it's really a matter also of human persons, and, and what uh, Robert stressed out to say that you, you will have an owner who will prefer to sell at a lower price, but in conditions which are better for his management team and, and for... Uh, I don't know, I, for the future of the company or the future he, he wishes for the company because SMEs, it's, it's, a, it's a story of a life. It's not like a big group the most of the time. It's, it's uh, middle-sized companies uh, where, as, a, as you said before, Frédéric, uh, in Luxembourg, uh, often ownership was transmitted from one generation to another. So it's, it's not just a business. And um, and I think that's why, uh, yeah, it's also very important to have advisors who understand this and who have the technical skills, but who are also aware of of that will need to to give a, yes maybe more explanation and and, and 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 to take the time for this, and and that's uh, for me an important point. And after all. I think uh, to partner with a private equity firm and to say what we said in the be beginning, uh, one should should um, um, ask the question with whom with whom do I want to have this partnership and to to select the private equity players and and because uh, above the financial structure it's it's a matter of human uh, relations between also investors and the management team and the owner who sometimes leaves or sometimes uh, keeps a stake in the company so yeah and my Maybe a, a quick one because I think we forgot the ethic part. Um, <laughs> so the, this point is very important, uh, as well as uh, ESG and sustainable consideration, of course. And <clears throat> believe me, uh, as an investment actor, it's uh, very difficult, let's say almost impossible to raise new money uh, if you don't include such element uh, in your strategy today. So this is key element, and you are absolutely right with ethics, but also other consideration. And it finally, it's also part of the value creation model because then it's not only financial; it's also non-financial, and that could be then the, the nice accelerator we were waiting for. Any other question or comment? Uh, hi, uh, I'm mostly dealing with uh, private equity valuation in the one of the big four. Uh, so when I read the, I have three short, very short questions. When I read the the the, the, the topic of the, the, the this event buyout as an exit strategy, I didn't think anything, any strategy, except retirement. What can be the potential other strategies? Because what you are currently discussing, we are discussing is based on the investor side, not the investee side as an exit strategy. You are mostly discussing about investment strategies. This one question. Second question is regarding the... Uh, um, you were discussing about the how to decide for the leveraged buyout. Uh, and uh, uh, sorry for not remembering your name, the, the P investor, uh, you were... the. Discuss, uh, you were telling that the long-term stable performance of the investee. So what do you, how do you, I think, in, I think this is a general question, how do you weigh the, the past historical data to the business plan for the future? I mean, how important, which one is more important personally or like in general from your business? Uh, third question is also from the investor side. Uh, if I want to go for a leveraged buyout, uh, I have to weight my average capital cost. And uh, the, th the thing is, like, if I have to go to a leveraged buyout, I have to see extra potential income uh, for my investment, right? Uh, this, is, this is a kind of a tricky part for the 
uh, for the leverage buyout. I mean, uh, to find the, f I mean, how to, how to, how should I find the fund from the fund to the uh, PE fund or from the bank, which we know that, sorry, but the bank provides the uh, loans quite higher than the PE funds. So this is a kind of the tricky part to do the in to the investment. How do you think that from the investor side, uh, you need to value the the investment? The thing is that leverage, the the debt leverage is okay, but there is a buffer between the EV multiple and the leverage multiple. So why do I have to care just the, the leverage multiple to do invest? If I have sufficient buffer between the EV multiple and the leverage multiple, why should I get scared? This is just a really good question that I want to have your feedback because I see also from my uh, portfolio that I'm doing the valuation, uh, they put a lot of importance to the, the, the leverage, but they forget the, the carried value of the cap of the investment itself so that's the, all the questions sorry uh, if i may on the last one so you're considering when the cost of of the, of the leverage so and and when you should or not but it's a matter of what what is the <coughs> the, the revenues of your company so if you have a, a cash flow that is above 10 percent your cash flow and uh, you you only have interest rates of three or four percent so the mass is very fast is done so of course if now the interest rates would go up to 12 percent and you only have 10 percent then then of course it makes no sense but but it's 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 quite the mass are, are quite the leverage is always good it's the money is cheaper than what the company produces so and and so that that part i don't know if somebody wants to to answer that also but that's 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 an easy one nowadays with low interest still low interest leverage uh, makes of course sense and leverage as much as you can if if there is enough cash flow and then i come i think it was for me the, the guy for the p so um so that's what so the past the past the past cash flow analysis is very important to analyze at least three four years especially if there were crises and and, and look at 2018 or so and look at what did the company do during this uh, turbulent uh, uh, periods that's very important was it still cash flow positive or not and 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 that's important because if if the market is strong the market must be anyway the industry the company should be in a market that is growing if you're in a market that is is going down or like toys r us as it's that is facing against amazon and and it's it, it's market you know that it will go down then you have a problem so at least your market must be a growing market and then you have to analyze simply the the worst possible periods and scenarios what could happen and if you still have enough cash flow uh, to to reimburse but as you said is if you have a p on your side then of course even in world in bad times the p can jump in of course most cases then the the managers get diluted a little bit depending how nice or how bad the p is, is playing the first question i already forgot and that's for somebody else I think the first question was relating to the investee, the valuation for investee instead of, of investor. Is it correct? Yes. Yeah, I would say simply, it depends on the strategy that the entrepreneur wants to to adopt. Uh, if you want to sell it to the to the management, if you want to sell it to industrial player or financial player, it will have different value for the investee, of course because we always have a mismatch between the uh, investment fund and, uh, and SMEs, for example, because uh, we believe uh, that valuation is mainly driven by uh, future cash flow, okay, but also the assets in the balance sheet. But um, whereas the entrepreneur may have a different point of view because he spent decades in the company, so it may be more... Uh, uh, cognitive biases, I would say, uh, creating the mismatch. I think his question was also why would an, an owner sell? Huh? So, in which cases an owner is selling? So, most in uh, most cases are people getting older and not having somebody to inherit. So, they want then the management to take over. That's one part. But in most cases, actually, it's, it's PEs, private equity firms. They must <laughs> the the managers of a PE. They want. To get their carry one day, yeah? so actually, they they are selling after seven to ten years in in average uh, again what they have in their portfolio. So there there is a lot of deals uh, happening coming out of the PEs. And maybe w w 
I'm not an active, uh, I'm not a PE investor, but from my, uh, I mean, uh, background uh, as a banker, um, I mean, in the new, uh, because you, I think your point, your point was about, uh, okay, there is only one case, retirement, uh, etc. But uh, in the new digital economy, uh, we, we see uh, some uh, new entrepreneurs. Um, they have created a lot of value in a short period of time. So it's not the the old-fashioned uh, industrial uh, sector, I would say, traditional sector. Uh, and for such uh, sector, we see tech entrepreneurs. Uh, they are very keen to have a cash event, uh, a, very, a first cash out, and make sure they can, I mean, cover uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, provide a, a lot of security uh, uh, to their to their family. Uh, that's uh, one of the key elements, and for that, they can do some LBOs. And um, there is no only a retirement people huh? <laughs> in this uh, new economy. As you can imagine, uh, if you see the public press, there is a lot of cases in the new, in this type of new IT uh, sector. And there is many cases, not only retirement. So having a first cash event is, uh, could be a, a key uh, element. And also most of the new tech entrepreneurs, they want to, uh, I mean, they're risking a bit their first uh, baby. They want to have a new project, so they are very keen to reinvest uh, that's, uh, that uh, portion of this cash event, cash out to a new sector, a new vertical uh, in terms of investment that could be, I don't know, traditional real, real estate, uh, for example, that could be another tech, uh, uh, new subject on the table. So you cannot imagine how, m how much people we've got in that type of scenario. There is a lot, if, uh, especially in Europe, uh, and there is a lot of cases. So it's not only retirement. Here it's just a typical case, and also it's adapted to the Luxembourgish market. So that's very important to know. There is a lot of cases uh, as this one, and uh, you've got one real example in this room, Griff Robert. Uh, of course, he's not uh, in, the, in the pension at all. Eh? He's very active, I guess, uh, as usual, but uh, I think it's a traditional Luxembourgish case. So. Not the only one. So, dear friends, uh, dear members of the association, please join me and uh, let's show our appreciation to those distinguished uh, panelists. <laughs> we can continue the questions and the dis discussion afterwards during the networking cocktail. And uh, the lesson uh, learned for today is we will certainly redo such sessions in the future. Thanks.